What's up, everyone? Today, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Jules James, Senior Marketing Ops Manager at Sixth Sense and Adjunct Professor at St. Edwards University. Jules got her start wearing multiple marketing hats, including web management and SEO for a variety of SMBs and later a big recruiting firm. And Jules decided to go back to school to pursue a PhD at the University of South Wales, undertaking work-based doctoral research while working with a growing e-com company. She later worked as a marketing automation manager at a few different tech companies, including Mitel and a talent software startup. Then Jules decided to move from the UK to Austin, Texas, to take an assistant professor of marketing gig at St. Edwards University. And she's still currently a part-time adjunct professor there. She's also freelanced in marketing operations, kind of moonlighting a little bit. And she also joined Blue Prism after that as a senior marketing ops manager. Finally, she had a short stint at Adobe before settling in at Sixth Sense, where she's currently leading marketing operations. Jules, thank you so much for your time today. Really excited to chat. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I listened to a lot of your uh, past podcast episodes, so uh, really grateful for all the interesting topics you've you've shared there. One thing that I kind of pulled from from threads is that a lot of your interviewers are kind of shocked to hear that you teach university level students practical automation skills. I actually have the pleasure of not being uh, too much of a stranger to that myself. Uh, I don't have your formal education, but at the our local university, University of Ottawa in Canada, we ran this 10 week intensive post grad course on digital marketing. And it was taught by 10 different instructors. And I had the pleasure of covering a full week on automation and MarTech. I taught that for three and a half years. My favorite part, and I'm curious to hear like your favorite part, was seeing all the minds that were blown when, when we're introducing them to MarTech and some of the capabilities, and also seeing a lot of the early students graduate and go on to have cool careers with like local MarTech and marketing ops agencies. So my first question, I got a two-parter for you here. Like, did you do all the course content yourself for the, the marketing-specific stuff? And what was your favorite part of, uh, of teaching? Um, I'll try and remember both of those questions. But yeah, I, I, I love teaching. I'm probably going to go backwards. Um, I love teaching because, like I said, seeing students who kind of, I teach on the master's course now. So they're, they're in jobs. They're most of the time doing some sort of marketing role or marketing adjacent role and teaching them practical kind of skill sets. Um, one, I can apply to everything that I do today. So I, I, every example I give is in my job today, this is what I do and this is how I use this tool. Um, and that really seems to resonate with the students that it's actual practical knowledge because when I did my degree 20 plus years ago, um, that horrible word, <laughs> 20 years ago, um, <laughs> it's, it was the six P's or the four P's and the, and the four ports, five forces and all these things from the sixties that, um, and the seventies and eighties that I have never used in my career, even like early start marketing careers. I've never actually used, I don't think I've ever built out of four P's. I don't think I've ever used a Porter's five forces. Um, and so I wanted to have, make sure students have the skills of when they go into like the real world of marketing, um, they know what actually they, they're kind of letting themselves in for. Um, the one thing that, the one thing when you ask like undergrads, especially like, what do you think marketing is? Like, I, I used to teach when I was full time, um, like the very basic, like fundamentals of marketing course. And the first question would be, what do you think of when you hear the word marketing? And they'd be like social media marketing, advertising, TV ads. And I'm like, teeny tiny part of marketing now used mm -hmm. to be, um, we used to be like all known for like doing pretty pictures and coloring, coloring things in. But now it's all about technology. Now it's all about driving revenue. Now it's all about using the tools that we have to prove kind of marketing's worth because we can track all of these things. We have all of these technologies. Like we have analytics, we have Marketo, we have Salesforce, we have Visible, we have all of these tools to track everything that we do today. And that is, I think, really interesting because most students don't think about that. They think about when they go into a marketing role, they're just going to do social media or they're just going to go and do some advertising. Well, actually, that's not very many roles anymore. Um, it's now all focused a lot more on just um, on the actual numbers and being able to to see kind of what does and doesn't work and being able to kind of drive that strategy. So that's kind of one of the reasons that I, I really love teaching. Um, and like I said, I think when students have like given me feedback, they've always said, I like 
to to see that you know like one what you're talking about and two it's things that you can relate to like I can be like in work today I did this thing and I used this piece of technology and I built these reports or I did this um so they can really it really makes sense versus think of a, a theoretical time on when you have to build a, like a, a four-piece model out so that definitely helps um and then in terms of creating the courses Pretty much all that content I create, we create from scratch, or I created all. So the tools and technologies course um, I created, the social media marketing course, social media analytics course, um, on the master's course, and then for the undergrads, um, we obviously have books to help us. But I'm sure you all know, marketing operations books like they don't really. There's a couple of people like I know, like Daryl Alfonso, like bought his book out, and it was great. However, like there's no books around Salesforce. I mean, there's a Sixth Sense book, but it's not about how to it's not technically about like the platform because things change all the time so as soon as you bring right. a book out it's going to go so yeah everything i developed <laughs> was using um of the skill sets and knowledge from having done it for so, for so long um but also like blogs and um things like community like market donation um anything any um uh ebooks that people have been bringing out because that actually is much more relevant Again, it's like real time, real world, like experiences and examples. And then, yeah, building the content. And so we, I spent a lot of time looking at what kind of what the objectives were of the course. Is a master course is the one that I teach on now. Um, so it's the Masters of Digital Marketing um, and Analytics. I forgot the title of the course then. And Digital <laughs> Marketing Analytics. Um, so we basically split that course down. So between myself, the head of our department at the time, and then a couple of the other professors, we basically broke it down and said, what do we think is going to be relevant? There's some stats courses in there, which are really relevant because you still need to know how to use Tableau or Domo, um, SPSS for some uh, measurement. There's some, um, kind of capstone courses, there's some practical courses. Um, so it's a combination of everything. Um, and obviously for me, I was like, tools and tech, give me anything that's technology based. I'll do all the marketing tech stuff because that's why live and breathe. Um, obviously with definitely the help of there were some really great resources and there still are like HubSpot has a great academy um, with all that free training um, Marketo used to they had a thing called University Online I don't know if anyone ever played with that um, and that was great like that I, I used to have my students go through that so they could get an understanding and kind of play in a simulated environment I did it with also um, Shift Paradigm they, they, now, they now are they had like a Six Bricks course so like trying to get the students hands on work um, Salesforce Trailheads I'm using that. So there's a lot of great resources. I don't have to build like training, like essential training out, but the theory behind it and just talking about like why we do these certain things. Um, yeah, pretty much built all of that out. Wrote those. And then every time I teach it, like I'm teaching social media marketing analytics right now. Um, I taught it in, just before Christmas, but I bring the deck up and I literally refresh it every single time mm -hmm. because you look at the dates on the things and I'm like, okay, this is out of date or that's out of date or we're looking at trends <laughs> and the trends change. So um you can write course content, but you also have to constantly refresh it. I was listening to your interview on the Pretty Funny Business podcast, yeah. uh, friends of ours, and it was it was an awesome episode. By the way, everybody should check it out. But yeah. I was kind of blown away a little bit that to hear that you were actually an electrical engineer in a former life and still use this skill as your hobby. You're such an interesting person, by the way. I uh, get bored really easily. That's all it is. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think it's just fascinating, like as you're talking about the courses that you teach, all the different roads that lead to MarTech and marketing operations. One thing that's been coming up a little bit with our guests is just like coding, no code. Like I'm, I'm all, all for this type of a trend. I've taught myself a little bit of coding, and I noticed that like I started almost from this point of view of like I didn't feel like an engineer unless I knew how to code. But I'm going to make an argument here. I'm curious what you think about it. Is that MarTech folks? actually employ some great examples of engineering and architecting systems even if they don't quote unquote code the systems they're using automation in ways that i think employ like this higher level of engineering function what do you think about this 100 percent um i think when people hear marketing operations and mark tech and we try and ex it's really hard to explain what you do as a marketing operations person and i'll tell people i'm a like an IT systems analyst, but for marketing, or IT systems <laughs> admin, but for marketing technology, like making them all work together. And people are like, oh, you must know how to code. You must know this. And I'm like, I know the basics of HTML, basics of JavaScript, basic, like basic AP, a very basic level stuff. Um, and I think you don't have to have the skill set of coding, 
but you have to have an understanding of how those things work together. And that's the important thing. And I think from like from an engineering standpoint, and, and you hear so many people who've come from like engineering backgrounds, one of my the other professors I work with, he was a, an automotive no, an aeronautics engineer mm-hmm. before he came into marketing. So like we all have this as much as I hate math, we all have this kind of understanding of how numbers work and how technology works. And so if you can understand that piece, you don't have to have a coding background. You just have to know the basics. I mean, the basics always help. Um, so if you can go into like a, a HTML email and you have to change a heading tag or you have to change a P tag, like to know that basics is really helpful. But most of the time, so many technologies now have brought in like drag and drop um, mm-hmm. to make it much, much easier. Um, I've been playing around in different tech and I don't, I don't necessarily know how to build APIs or SQL, like in fully in depth, but I can do a drag and drop and I can figure out how to like make these two connections work using like this teeny bit of SQL. Um, and I think that's, that's, I think that's true of a lot of, I think any, any ops roles, not necessarily just marketing ops, but rev ops, um, sales ops, anyone who goes into an operations role, they think, oh, it must be very like coding heavy or it must be very tech heavy. Um, it's not, it's really understanding how systems work. That's what it's about. And I think the biggest thing is also being curious, like being willing to troubleshoot and, and find problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the one thing I loved about when I was doing my engineering stuff is I was, I wasn't coding. I was, I was building circuit boards and I was, I was pulling apart engines and like blowing up engines, um, mm-hmm. doing, doing all those fun things. It was an automotive company. So we got to do some really fun things, but the math didn't come into play until towards the end. And actually when the math came into play in engineering, I went, I'm out. I actually don't <laughs> like math. I don't think like this engineering thing is for me. Um, didn't realize that in marketing, I would be using math. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Just, yeah. So it, it, it's definitely, that makes sense. It's not more, it's more an understanding of how everything works versus you don't need to know the ins and outs of JavaScript or APIs or it definitely helps you advance in your career. And if you think you want to go into like more of an architect role, um, it definitely helps. But you don't have yeah. to have a 100% coding background. I'm the same. I'm self-taught, completely self-taught, which is one of the other reasons why I like teaching it because I had to redesign a website and uh, had a company full of developers, actually my research company, company full of developers. They get, they said, oh, I explained we need to redo their website. It was the worst thing I'd ever seen. Mm. Um, and I was like, great, I've got 20 developers here, like they're e-commerce platform developers. Can you help, like, can I have someone to help me get this website like fixed and sorted? They were like, nope, here you go. Here's, um, here's the, here's like, here's the logins, go and do it yourself. And it literally was all in code. And I kind of opened up and went, so Google, what does this mean? And (laughs) figured my way around that website without, without the help. At least today, you'd, you'd be able to throw snippets of that in, in, in ChatGPT and, and ask it to, to figure some of that stuff out for you. I totally, yeah, no, <laughs> I totally resonate with this idea of knowing enough to, to be dangerous mm-hmm. and know how to like dig deeper. And um, yeah, I, I, I think there's no shortage of AI tools out there today to help you take that entry level SQL skills into like helping you understand a little bit more and speak that like developer language so that like when you're having those meetings, you can be eye level and understand like the tables that they're talking about. And so, yeah, it's a uh, very powerful oh, yeah. one. One thing I wanted to ask you about was like um, you, you mentioned like a bunch of these these smart tech tools and a lot of your systems experience. Uh, I myself haven't had the pleasure of uh, working in Sixth Sense. I, I've been like learning about the platform from an external perspective. Um, but you shared ahead of this interview that Sixth Sense doesn't actually use lead scoring per se, like you, the team kind of dog feeding, like using Sixth Sense uh, as a team. Um, you've adopted this account based focus centered around intent data and six QA modeling. So basically like qualified accounts, right? Instead of qualifying leads, we're qualifying multiple leads within an associated account. So I'd love for you to just walk us through like how as your marketing ops team, have you switched the focus from driving MQLs to engaging with personas in your ISP, your ICP to drive qualified accounts? Um, It was definitely hard. Um, When I I joined Sixth Sense, they had kind of 
pretty much moved away from scoring, but there was still some scoring happening and they were focusing on accounts. But as, a, as an ops person who's been doing this for many, many years, I kind of came in and went, so what's what? Why why no lead scoring? What's happening? Like why <laughs> I I couldn't. It took me probably six months to get my head around not using lead scoring. Um, and the day I actually turned off our lead scoring, it hurt because I was like, I've been using like lead, lead scoring is is everything. Lead scoring is everything we should be doing. <laughs> we draw. We live our world by MQLs. Um, but realizing that actually using like the tool, we obviously yeah we use our own internal tools. Using Sixth Sense, being able to see which accounts are actually in market and being able to drive based on their intent, based on do they fit our ICP? Are they, what buying kind of stage are they in? Um, what keywords are they looking for? We could then drive those account level qualifications coming through. So we call them six QAs. It's kind of like the standard um, functionality of Sixth Sense. It uses AI to be able to figure out who those six QAs are, use predictive modeling um, to figure out who your kind of propensity to buy accounts are going to be. And then we kind of flipped it on its head of saying, okay, so now we know the right accounts. So we kind of know the companies of who who is searching for keywords like us or our competitors. Um, they haven't filled in a form yet, but they, we kind of know the accounts and who they are. Um, and that was the real, that was kind of the, the biggest thing to me of obviously we are so driven by you. Everyone must, everyone must fill in a content form. Everyone must download something. We must be able to score these people because they downloaded a form or they, download an ebook or they register for an event those aren't necessarily just the things that qualify someone actually people at the company searching for your keywords going on your website being able to track what pages they're looking for being seeing obviously seeing what campaigns they're engaging with because that all kind of drives into that intense scoring model once we start to see that engagement being able to then say okay now we know the accounts obviously the reps the first thing that you'll get from any rep if you are not working the mql is who do I need to speak to? Um, and that was huge for me. I was, I was like, but how How do we know? How do we know who the reps need to speak to? Like, Because obviously the reps now have these qualified accounts. They have to know who they have to go after. So that's where on the ops side, we spent a lot of time figuring out the personas on the accounts. So um, we're spending time to look at who, who are the buying committees? Because again, we know that um, we have an amazing research um, team here. So Kerry Cunningham did a lot of work of figuring out like who are those, what do those buying committees look like? Because we know it's not just one person anymore. We know it's five, six, seven, it could be up to 13 or 14 people who are on a buying committee. And then we looked at all of our closed one deals and said, okay, so who are the people on those opportunities? Um, not necessarily the names, but the types of people. Is it an ops person? Is it a sales exec? Is it a um, marketing leader? Once we figured out that, that then drove everything we do in operations to say, okay, now we need to go and figure out, do we have the right people on the account? Do we have the right persona? So we have like this ginormous, uh, I built this ginormous persona map out. We have 33 personas that we use. Um, the key personas is about 10, but there's kind of 33 personas we have in the system. It drives all of our basic job titles down into persona. We can then look at in Salesforce, do we have these right personas on these accounts that are 6 qa and then if we don't, we use our own tool. We use Sixth Sense to go and say, okay, so company A, 6QA, there is someone at that account that is searching for us. How do we then, we figure out, do we have the right personas on that? Because obviously we have the persona stamping to the contact. If we don't have the right personas, we use our orchestration tool to go and find the right people and then put them onto the account so that when sales is basically gets that 6QA, they have the right people, they have the right account. They know that they're, they're literally actively searching for us today. And I think... That is much more efficient and effective than Joe Bloggs downloaded a ebook. Go and speak to them because Joe Bloggs might be um, a marketing assistant. It might be a researcher. It could be an intern. Um, they might not be the right person. But then we also don't focus on just one person at the account. The team looks at, the sales team looks at this. They, we call it multi-threading. So we know that there's these four key personas we have to go after. So the, the reps will go and speak to those four key personas, whether it's through our peer-to-peer -peer nurtures, whether we do it through sales loft, um, through like sales cadences, we have conversational email, which is our internal tool, um, our internal AI email tool, which is um, actually really cool. Um, we're doing some really, really fun things with that. But we're able to kind of have conversations with multiple people um, and then find the right person and get the right people on those opportunities. Like it, 
it takes it takes a village it takes like the entire ops team it takes working really closely with the sales team it takes working really closely with our analytics team um and i think that's one thing i really enjoy at six senses because it's not just why didn't my lead mql like they're not the conversations that we have with our reps mm -hmm. anymore it will be this account six qa'd why did it six qa have i got the right account like the right people on my account to go after what kind of um strategy can i use which tool should i use to have conversations with them and that definitely changes the mindset of just we need to mql everyone because that's our goal that's not our goal our goal is we are driving revenue we're driving pipeline we're able to tie everything we do back to like how much are we influencing those opportunities being opened yeah very cool appreciate you unpacking that yeah. do you think that there's a world where you can have both account-based scoring also lead scoring because like one of the shortfalls you mentioned it's like oh we have like the account based model now and we know companies to target and go outbound for but we don't really know which specific people from that account to tell our sdr team to go after but the lead scoring model would at least tell you maybe not who the decision maker is but who potentially is that champion or that like first researcher persona who's like starting that research like does six sense like kind of marry the two together like can you still see individual people who were active on the site like at least from like a, a, a first party data perspective yeah so we can see those people so okay yeah if you are an organization that doesn't want to go fully at account based which lots of companies don't i've spoken to people and been like do you want to go fully account and we have lots of conversations with customers and that's the ops team the sales team the marketing team will actually have conversations like we'll have phone calls with our customers and it freaks them out when we're like, we don't use scoring, like lead scoring. Everything's account-based and not a lot of companies are ready to go fully account-based. Hmm. Um, so yeah, a combination of the two, you can use a lead scoring, you could use intent data. Um, you could actually build those two together to create like your MQL and you can have your six QAs and you can have your MQL. So your intent doesn't necessarily have to be, sorry, your MQL doesn't necessarily have to be just behavior in terms of they filled in this form. It could be they filled in this form and also someone from this account is showing high intent, add that to your lead scoring model as well. And then you're even driving towards kind of a semi account based model. So you have like the who and the account and the intent and the actual physical actions. Um, mm -hmm. You can start to pull it together. And I've, I've done that in a couple of places before. Very cool. Yeah. I've worked with uh, Six Sense a little bit on the web side of things. So mm -hmm. like with the the plugins and being able to like uh, kind of amend the, the Six Sense data over top of like web analytics data. And one of my clients, I've noticed this almost shift and something we've talked a little bit with other guests. And I'm just curious your take on is just like this. We as marketers over the last particularly 10 years have gotten a little drunk on all the analytics that we can get off of. But like you mentioned it, like a lot of people's perception of marketing is really that front end, the social media, the advertisements and stuff. I kind of feel like we're in the stage where we're starting to recognize, hey, I've to build brand, to build intent and demand, we've got to do things that aren't directly measurable, but we still need to measure them. We still need to understand the intent behind them. Do you think that tools like Sixth Sense are enabling people to be a little bit more free, placing bigger bets out there in the market and building your brand in ways that uh, maybe you wouldn't if you're just driving towards like, I need content download so that I can get MQL and then like hitting this target. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, definitely. It, it, gives the, it gives you the ability to, because you're not necessarily driving on, we must have these lead scores happening. Um, it can help with driving. We want to try this really cool ad campaign and we can see in six cents, like who's engaging with those ad campaigns. It might not necessarily drive straight to revenue, but because we can then start to track who is going through the buying stages, like not everything has to tie back to revenue. It could just be we want to move this set of accounts from one buying stage to another buying stage. It could be as simple as that. And so if we're doing it, sending out an awareness ad or if we're sending out um, some nurtures, like our, we have a peer-to-peer -peer nurture, which is for net new records that come in, very basic level, kind of high level content of like, so we are with Sixth Sense, this is some things you might be interested in because, again, we don't know always who is searching for us, but when we get the right mm -hmm. personas, we want to be like, oh, someone in your account, someone in your company was searching for us or was interested in our Sixth Sense product. We use that to drive to the next stage of their buying journey. Um, so you're not always so focused on, I have to generate 500 MQLs this month, so I have to create this much content and I have to um, make sure it's behind 75 different forms. It's I want to drive people's 
interest in our product. But on top of that, we're also looking at what other competitors they're searching for as well. Mm-hmm. So it's not just looking for us. So it's not just engaging with us. It's those keywords. So the, are they searching for our competitors? Are they searching for keywords related to us? And I think if you were driving all of your content, there's thousands and millions of keywords out there. I think it's very hard for any company to create enough content to match all those keywords and to match mm-hmm. all of that intent. Whereas to have that freedom to say like, well, we just, we're just focusing on these keywords and we're focusing on this intent. Um, we can do some really fun, like some really awesome campaigns. And we just, we just recently launched one. It's called Dump Your Data Vendors, like a Valentine's campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that a B2B brand would not normally do. It's kind of completely out of the box because it's driving, like we're, we're, we're kind of playing with it to see what can we do because we're not focused on, we have to get the MQLs. We're focused on these sets of accounts moving from this stage to this stage. And if we generate six QAs from that, awesome. It kind of it helps us, helps give us that a little bit more freedom. Yeah, I think that freedom in marketing is key. And I, I always feel like we're so artificial in the way that we try to like generate the funnel and life cycle. Like we're humans, like how do you buy? Like we feel very impulsive. Like there's there's an element of emotionality to it and capturing that I think is is really cool. Thanks for outlining that. One thing I want to ask you about is automating automation. Like mm-hmm. we were kind of talking before, but I just want to give you the mic here and, and get your take on this. Like uh, increasing efficiencies, automating super repetitive tasks that kick off other automations, like the inception of automation. Give us a little yeah. down here. Um, this is something I've been working on for probably the past, oh, hang on, what are we in? February. Um, five or six months now, I'm playing with um, Talk of Wakato. So it's a kind of an automation tool. And it's been really interesting to figure out those laborious. Like the one thing that I, the reason I got into automation as a whole is as humans, we're inherently lazy. We want to figure out the shortest way, route to do something. So I was manually lead scoring 60,000 records every single week, doing an Excel spreadsheet with a VLOOKUP. So I was like, there must be an easier way to do this. Discovered automation, like, it does it all for me? We have these smart campaigns and flows. That's great. And now I'm like, so what else can we do to make even that, even those automations quicker and easier? So using Wakato really discovered that you can actually automate even more things inside Marketo than Marketo would normally allow you to do. So like right-click and cloning a, a, a program, a webinar program can take some time. Like you do the right-click, you clone, you sit there and wait for it to open up. You have to go into those smart campaigns, make any edits for a webinar program. Using Mercato, I've been able to get, we have, a, we have customer trainings. We have customer trainings and it's about anywhere from 50 to 100 customer trainings, webinars a month. So obviously you can imagine we have to go in and set up 50 to 100 webinars. And this is just one of one of the many things that we do, but setting up the customer trainings, right click clone, go into the forms, make those changes, go into smart campaigns, update all the emails with the right dates, updating all the tokens. You can imagine 50 to 100 times how long that was taking. Um, it was pretty much someone's full-time job. And then on mm-hmm. top of that, you have to do all the QA and make sure it all works. Um, so using Wakato, I was able to, like from an Excel spreadsheet, take that information, run it through Wakato, and then basically clone and create all of those programs, all of the Salesforce campaigns, update all the tokens. Um, and it went from something like 60 plus hours to 30 minutes Wow! to do that. Mm-hmm. And that, like using, and that's why I'm like, okay, so if I can do this, like if I can basically free up someone's, would take them a week and a half's worth of work before the QA, just, just the cloning and repeating. And that was kind of being fairly kind of, conservative on the times of like to clone this and then to update this and to update the tokens i tried to work out how much it would take to and i think i said 30 minutes per program Mm -hmm. um to automate that to free up someone's time to actually be to be able to spend time on more interesting and fun things not just cloning and repeating um (laughs) i was like what else can we do how far how far can we push this thing Mm -hmm. um and that's that's really where my focus is right now is like efficiencies between the team. Like the team, we spend a lot of time doing list uploads. We spend a lot of time creating web, like creating events and programs. Um, we also have our nurtures. We have all the standard automation things. How else can we make it quicker? So um, we have CMO. We have our CMO coffee talks. It happens every week. Um, there's two events happening every week. Um, we have it going now. It's a recurring webinar. Now you cannot connect recurring webinars. In, like they do, that doesn't physically happen. So we were manually every twice a week on the Friday, downloading the list from Zoom, putting it into Salesforce as it was like a list upload. Um, and we were like, there must be an easier way to do this. Like we must be able to again save time. 
Same thing in Wakato. We've figured out now that we can actually connect Zoom meetings. Recurring Zoom meetings comes through Wakato, puts them into Zoom, um, gets their Zoom link. We get the Zoom link, push that back into a token. So they get their reminder emails with the right links. And then once the meeting is over, it pulls all that information automatically from Zoom, creates a Salesforce campaign, and uploads them all into the Salesforce campaign like this. Mm-hmm. And so as soon as the meeting is finished, everything's there and ready to go. And obviously being our CMO copy talks, it gets a lot of um, high visibility in the organization. So we've now automated that. And we only literally launched that last Friday. Um, but just saving saving that time of a, a list download and a list upload would take an hour maybe to do that and create the Salesforce campaign. That now frees up some, someone else's time that they have. They don't have to spend that hour or two hours every, every week every week doing the same thing go into zoom download it get the list create the salesforce campaign upload it like that doesn't have to that doesn't have to happen anymore so there are some really interesting ways in which that's what kind of automating the automations like we are driving figuring out how can we speed up processes and we don't want to have to do list uploads all day every day because we have events obviously we get lists from from third party events it takes time to clean the list get all the right data, like capitalize things in the right way. There are tools now that help us do that. And also, there's other multiple tools that would do that. Just Wakata is the one that I spend a lot of time working in. Um, and that's kind of where that, going back to that, that coding question of, I don't know a lot of SQL, but using Wakato, because there's some, some real funky things that we're starting to do, I've had to kind of get my SQL hat back on again and be like, okay, so how do I join this to this? And how do I dedupe this and that and make all this lowercase? So it's been like, I don't necessarily know the ins and outs of SQL, but I can use enough to be dangerous <laughs> to make this process that used to take some time more efficient and effective. And I think we're going to be pushing it even like our new financial year just started. We're going to push it even further of what else can we do to free up the te- team's time because we're, I mean, everyone's always busy. Everyone's always so, so stacked with things to do. If we can, if I, if, it, if I can even free up 10 minutes of someone's time of not having to clone a program, like it comes in our Asana request, we can automate that program gets created and cloned. Like even just to do that, make someone more efficient and effective. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just it's really interesting just figuring out where we can save time and then where it, it gives it, it then gives the team time more time to do fun things like in mops. Like well, we want to try things differently. We want to see if we can break things. We want to try nurture us <laughs> in a different way, or we want to see how we're going to pass information. So it's it's all about making the most of like being able to grow the team so they're not spending two years doing list uploads all day every day i don't <laughs> want if, if anyone and i know people who do that like i don't want anyone to have to do that as their daily job um i want them to be able to learn and grow and understand like increase their skill set in operations um and so if i can take that laborious task away from them to give them time to do that that's what i want to do very cool. I love the the topic. I love how you're calling it automating automation yeah. or I think JT had a good idea for the episode title there, uh, automation inception. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like that. But it's or yeah, uh, it's no mops people harmed in the making of this webinar. <laughs> yeah. What you're describing there, like ferrying lists from systems in the system. Like there's some <laughs> agency that's crying right now thinking, Oh God, where are my billables coming from? But Yeah. And and, and it is it is harsh. It it can, but if it's gonna help, like if we can save the company money and it means that I can actually get someone internally extra like and get an extra headcount to help the team then that's what I'm going to do because if it helps the team grow, it's going to help the company overall. Yeah. I think one of the benefits of having a bigger MOPS team is that you can have a Jules on the team who is responsible for like thinking of things like, hey, like there is a repeatable process here. These list uploads are taking way too long. Yeah. Maybe there's a better way to do this. And you go off on discovery land and you try stuff in Workato and then you come back and you're like, hey, let's try this out. The reality in smaller teams or even like one person mops team is that they're so reactive mm-hmm. on continuing to do the stuff they need to do because there's a bunch of other stuff on the list that like there isn't as much time or like they lack the ability to dedicate time to thinking about like different ways of, of like improving the current work that that they're doing. And you talk about this a little bit at, at Mobsapalooza when you debated the merits of this like decentralized model of building a Mops team versus centralized and, and hybrid. 
you talked about having been the individual mops person uh, in previous companies in a decentralized model and how hard it is not just to like balance what you're doing and finding other ways of automating that, but also preventing marketers from chasing shiny objects. This is something we talk about a lot here. Um, what advice do you have for listeners that are in those shoes today, the one person mops team, or maybe even like smaller startups and like they're wearing the mops hat, but a bunch of other hats too. How can they focus on being both an educator and an architect for MarTech? It's, it's definitely difficult when it's, when you're a small team. Um, yeah. I'm very, very lucky that we have the team here that we have, we give, it gives us some time to be able to go and do those, those really fun things. Um, and I know, I know how hard it is when it's just you. Um, and I think that's one thing that one thing I want to do with like the automation stuff is I, I want to be able to talk about it more because I want to show people that like, we have this recipe, like you can go and the good thing about what we can share, I want people to take those tools and make more of them when they don't have time. They don't have time to necessarily, I'm not going to say innovate, they don't have time to think about ways in which we can speed up the upload process. Um, but I think for smaller organizations, it's, it's having that it's having that drive to think about what's the thing that I do every single day, and even if it's just one thing, what's the one thing that I do repetitively that I can figure out how to how to make better? Um, and it can take some time, but I'm like tokenizing the programs, like blew my mind when I first realized that thing was possible. Because same thing when it was just me and I was just cloning an email program and going into email and making the changes and going to the next email and making the changes and going to the next email and like literally the same webinar date putting it in the same place, like four different times, like invite emails, reminder emails, confirmation emails, seven different places. I'm putting the same webinar title and webinar date. Once I found like tokens, something as simple as that was like, oh, hang on, this is, it, it's going to take me eight hours or whatever it is to tokenize an entire program template. But if I spend that time to do that one thing, in the long run, it's actually going to save me so much more time. And I think that's with small companies or small organizations. It's sometimes being, having having the willingness to be like, okay, I'm doing this thing over and over again. There must be an easier way. And then kind of taking that step back and saying, okay, it's my, it's going to take me a day to do this thing. But in the long run, I know it's going to save me time. So being kind of, not, I'm not going to say brave enough, but like just having the confidence to say, I need to do this thing. I need to build this tokenized program or I need to build this recipe or I need to, figure out how to automate this, whether it's set up new smart campaigns for country standardization, something as simple as that, to figure out what that thing is, to show like how it's going to save you time. Because once you've started saving time with one thing, and then you start figuring out that other next repetitive process, like country, country standardization was one of those, oh, I'm trying to build a list and I've got 75 versions of the United States. Um, I was like, there must be... Why every every time I was building this when I first started in Marquette, I was like, I'd go and get the list. I'd go and find all the, all the different variations of, go and do like a change date of value if I wanted to keep it clean. And every time I did a campaign, I would do that. I was like, there must be there must be an easier way. Um, like that's the whole point of Marquette. Like the power of it is we can run those automated campaigns. So understanding the power of the tool is also really good as well. Um, I think not everyone always understands how powerful some automation tools, or actually a lot of automation tools can be. Um, they just think, oh, I'm just using it to send emails or I'm just doing like a basic um, nurture campaign and, and then thinking about actually how far can I push this tool? You don't necessarily have to get other tools in place, but how far can I push this tool? Um, when you figure out how far you can push like a tool, you then figure out, okay, what else can I do outside of this tool as well? Um, like I did it a way back, way back when where we had a big event, multiple, um, it, was, it was a big kind of conference, online conference, kind of when COVID, before, just before COVID, well, COVID was actually kind of hit, it was one of the clients, um, built a landing page, had, they had 25 different options of sessions they could attend. And I was like, well, we either send out 25 different confirmation emails if they select all of these sessions, which is going to really blow up someone's inbox and they're really going to annoy someone, or I figure out how to send one email with all of their confirmation links in it. So taught myself velocity scripting. I was like, okay, there must be a way to do this thing. Um, like I said, as humans, we are like, we are lazy. So I'm, I always try and think about, well, not honest, not all humans. I'm lazy. I want to figure out the quickest and easiest way to do something. 
Um, so the next time it happens, like next time that event comes up, I'm like, I've already built this. Grab that velocity script. I've already everything's ready to go. Saves me um, so much time. So I think that's the biggest thing. And in decentralized or like small person teams, single person teams, um, it was really relying on the network around me. And I, t- I tell this story a lot, but when I, my very first day on my very first marketing automation job, um, as a marketing global marketing automation manager, <laughs> ever, um, I kind of I understood the premise of it. I understood the strategy behind it. I kind of got how it worked, and I'd been doing like these manual the manual scoring, and I'd played around in like Eloqua, and I'd played around a little bit in Acton, and some of those basic ones from back in the day. But I'd never opened Marketo, so that my first day on the job, I opened it up and went, "Shit, <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now?" So. My, like Shit, Nate's, what is this user yeah. interface what have i got things? myself into yeah, i'm sure if you remember from 10 years ago what it looked like and i was like that's kind of pretty it's purple but now what do i do um marketo nation was like my like my bible um josh hill's like his rock star guide from like back in the day like yeah. that thing i lived in day in and day out i was like how do i do this thing so there there's so much there's so much educational materials and and the network around you, like never be afraid to ask questions on nation, join those Slack groups. Like there, there's, the, there's two people, like the big Slack groups, not Slack, Slack groups that are out there. Join them and ask questions because you'll be surprised how many people have been in the same boat or are in currently the same boat and are trying to figure out ways to do it. Hmm. Um, it's not, it's not an Island when you're just one person on the team. Um, it's really not just you, because if you do start to reach out and say like, I have this problem, you're going to get five or six people coming back and be like, well, here's, here's, and there's multiple ways to do it, but here are three or four different ways in which you can do mm-hmm. this thing. Um, and that's the other thing is just not, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and I think as, as ops people, we are always asking questions and we're always, always um, questioning and being curious about ways in which we can do things. And I think as a single person team or decentralized team, you actually get more chances to do that. Hmm. Um, and you're more likely to do that than you are sometimes in a in a larger org. Because in a larger org, you're just churning through things because you think everything's working as it should. But when you get stuck in those little single person teams, you're like, "Who do I speak to?" Ask the questions. Don't be afraid mm-hmm. to join the Slack groups. Don't be afraid to join Nation or I think HubSpot has its own community. Like all those different communities, and 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 reach out on LinkedIn. Join groups on LinkedIn. Just there are people out there that will, that will help. I think there's a lesson there. I love that uh, the almost humility, but the the gutsy start, right? Like you didn't open up Marketo, but now you're managing it, and you pivoted that to become, I think, a, what a seven time Marketo champion. Yeah. So I want to just kind of dive in there a little bit, like uh, your experience as a marketing operations pro. One of the things that we had, we had a recent guest on and they were talking about freelancing versus being in house, and they really came down heavy on the idea that. You know, one year freelancing equals four years in house. It's something that Phil and I uh, have debated back and forth a little bit. We have both kind of sides of the spectrum. I'm doing freelance, and I've done a bit of freelance in my life, uh, and I know you have. You've done both as well. Uh, so my current stance right now, just to kind of have a nice little middle ground, is that I think that freelancing provides you with an opportunity to really level up your platform skills. Yeah. But one year freelancing is is one year of experience freelancing. It's not necessarily better or worse than being in house. But I'm just curious what your take is. You've done quite a bit of it yourself. So, like, do you think every marketing office person should have a stint in an agency or a consultancy? Does it really make you better in house? Um, it definitely helps. I think if I wasn't freelancing, um, I've I've probably been in thirty plus different instances of Marketo through various freelance, whether it's been a big project or a small project. So having that exposure to all of those different variations um, is huge because it will you will help you understand like everyone talks about best practice um, and there's I don't think there's any such thing as best practice for everyone it's best practice for your organization and freelancing really helped me understand that because I'd go into one instance and be like oh so you do this thing this way go into another instance the next day and be like oh hang on they do the same thing but they do it this way. Um, because it's what works for those organizations. And I think having having that knowledge of those different instances and how they all work together, like it's the one thing I love. Again, it's being curious. I, I want to see how people do different things. I'm really nosy. How do people, how does company A do their nurtures versus how does company B do their nurtures? Do they do nested nurtures? Do they do standard emails? Like that really helps guide 
when you're in like a full-time in-house role because having that experience so again if you're in an in-house role and you've only ever been in one instance you don't necessarily see all of the different ways in which you can do things Jen 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 De Maria or Jen Keeler now and I um have spoke at Marketo a couple of times like Schrodinger's cat there's the same there's multiple ways in which you can do the same thing like how you set up your forms how you set up your compliance programs how you set up um your subscriptions whatever it is if you don't know what you don't know like if you don't if you haven't been in different instances you don't know how people set things up differently people will talk about it on nation and people will give examples but until you're actually in there and playing with it um you don't really know what works for everyone and you might think you've got the best way to do something and you may have but if you start to freelance and understand like there's seven different ways to do this one thing you then when you're in-house you can say well actually for us We've tried it this way. Let's try it the other way because I've seen it the other way and I've played with it and built it the other way. And I think with with freelancing, like one year could be, but one year could be with one client. One year could be with five clients. So it's a def- it's a difficult question to answer. Like, is one year better than like mm-hmm. in house or, or not in house? I think it's just working with even if it's two or three clients, like small clients, small projects, just getting into different instances makes a difference. Agency definitely helps. Um, I've never actually worked at an agency, but I can, I know people who have, and they've said that it's really been beneficial to them because they are surrounded by MOPS people and only MOPS Mm. people. And they are working on very specific tasks of, we have to do this thing for our clients. And that's really helped them grow because obviously if you're surrounding yourselves by like these amazing minds that are all doing the same thing, it helps expand your knowledge as well as going into those different instances. Um, as a freelancer kind of similar to the decentralized thing like you are kind of on an island when it's just you mm-hmm. um so it, it helps it helps to understand how everything works but if you don't have those people around you that you can ask those questions to um you might as well just be in-house doing the same thing because if you're if you're a freelancer you're doing the same thing in 30 instances you're not really learning yeah. anything but if you're mm-hmm. a freelancer that is kind of looking at and how different ways of building different companies are building different things and you're asking questions as to like why do you do this this way or speak to like other mops people and be like i've seen this in this mm. instance and i've seen that in that instance why are they doing it in, in these two different ways that helps because I, I sometimes it's tough when you when it's just a freelancer like when it's just me and i'm like i think i'm doing this right uh i i've been doing this for a while now but i think this is how you build a nurture this is what they're asking for um and it's and it's actually kind of scary being a freelancer because people are rent uh, not renting you people people are <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> renting yeah, your time getting, yeah people are hiring you because you're an expert in what they need help with so you have to yeah. also remember that like they've, they've bought me on because they need help with this thing that i specialize in but it's also kind of scary that i'm like okay it's me helping this entire organization um am i doing it right um so that's also the other scary i think it helps with the confidence piece because i'm like okay i can send out this email and i can build this thing for this three million dollar Three, not three, million, three million record um, contact database. Not a problem. I'm promise I'm not going to send it out to the wrong amount of people. <laughs> and I did. Like one of my clients, I the only the one and only time I sent like a big mass email and screwed it up like royally was a client. Um, <laughs> sent it out to eight hundred thousand people instead of thirty thousand people. <laughs> was able to stop it thankfully because I didn't look at my all filters and my and filters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's it gives you that confidence to like make those mistakes. But also you have to remember that. Um, the client is paying you. <laughs> Very cool. That there's there's so many there's so much wisdom in in that answer there, especially like this idea of seeing the art of the possible by going into different instances and seeing how other folks have set stuff up. Um, myself in a house, like one way I've done something similar is these like idea of um like mind share meetings that happen regularly with other companies and similar type of industries and we do like a screen share and like sometimes we have to sign NDAs, but it's like, here's how we're doing something and we compare notes and we discover new tools and we learn new ways of doing it. So yeah, love, love your points there. Uh, Jules, I think there's, there's a bunch of other stuff we, we could have gone down uh, rabbit holes on, but we're, we're already at time. We're going to hit you up with one last question. We asked this for uh, all of our guests. You're a mops leader, a professor, a consultant, an automation expert, a speaker, you're also a tattoo piercing studio owner, a double cat mom, a Funko Pop collector, a Potterhead, and also a car aficionado. Uh, one, like I said, one question we ask all of our, our guests is, how do you remain happy and successful in your career? And how do you find balance between 
all of these things in your personal life, but all the things you're working on while staying happy? Good question. Um, like I said, I get bored real easy, um, which is why I have a lot of interests and a lot of hobbies. Um, and I think for me, that's the one thing is being able to find something that interests and excites me every day um, and and figuring out what's what's different and what's new and how can I try and do something different um, is definitely the one thing that helps me in my career. Um, and every day is different. And I think that's that's the one thing that keeps me going is if every day was the same, if I was doing list uploads every single day for two years, like I would not have been in mops for more than probably three months. Um, but mops is always different and it's always changing. And what I did when I started in mops many years ago to what we're doing today is is still different. And I think what we're going to do in two years time is going to be different again, whether it's more automations, whether it's the tools are going to change. AI is obviously coming in and making a difference and having having that help us. The tech is constantly advancing. And I think if, if as an ops person, you are willing and want to learn those advancements, um, that's great. And that's that's what keeps me happy. Um, and yeah, like I said, I just, for me, I just really like trying different things. I, I say my brain is like a little sponge. I love to learn new things. I love to like try new things. And I do lots of things because I want to keep kind of this busy. I want to make sure that my, my brain is busy and, and kind of learning and trying something else because I can't just sit and watch TV at the, at the end of the day. Like when my work day is over, I don't just sit and watch TV. I was, I've got like the TV on in the background, but I've got my laptop or my phone or I'm figuring out new things or trying new things or I'm doing a different course or I'm like doing, if I'm teaching, whatever it is, like I am always, I always kind of want to keep it going now. It, it can be exhausting and not, I'm not saying everyone has to like do all these things all the time, but yeah. for me, that's my happiness is just trying and learning constantly. Um, doing something different and just, yeah, just keeping it interesting. That's that's the big thing. Very cool. I really appreciate that answer. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. You shared a ton of stuff with with folks and, and listeners today. So I really appreciate your time and uh, figuring out a way to do this from, from your closet away from uh, all the renos in your yeah. house there. Appreciate that. <laughs> 